Does your life ever feel like a roller coaster ride? Anyone? Am I the only one? Ups, downs, twists, turns. Almost like it's, you're on a roller coaster and you're blindfolded because you can't see any of this coming, right? You know, as Christians, we, we may feel like one day we are soaring on a peak of inspiration and our faith is strong. And then the next day we might feel like we're plummeting into a valley of fear and doubt. But we need to remember that as Christians, God is always with us. And, and many times, it's, it's not the destination as much as it is the journey that God is working through to draw us closer to Him. And that's certainly the case when you look at the life of Abram. Uh, you see him going through these ups and downs and twists and turns, and God is with him, helping him to grow in his faith. It reminds me of childhood road trips. Do you remember what it was like when, when you were a child and your parents took you on a road trip? What, what, are, what are some of the things that children always say were when they're on this road trip? Are we there yet? How much longer? I have to go to the bathroom. You know, and then, if, of course, if the kids are in the back seat together, the siblings, you know, they're always bickering and fighting and arguing. He's touching me. She's on my side. And the parents are just at their wits end trying to keep their kids entertained on the trip. I remember uh, one of the first cross-country road trips I went on. I was only nine years old. It was the spring of 1976. And we were on a road trip from Portland, Oregon to Denver, Colorado. My father on my dad's side, Bert Kennedy, lived in Colorado. He was a, a sheep rancher, a sheep shearer, actually. And uh, we, I'd never seen him. I'd never met him before this trip. So we decided to go to Colorado that, during that spring break of 1976. And uh, we were, uh, all five of us, my mom, my dad, me, my brother and sister were packed into this little Honda station wagon. I think it was a Civic. And uh, of course, my brother and sister are older than me, so I was in the middle in the back, and my brother and sister had the window seats. And I remember these long, boring stretches of Wyoming. Ah, oh, and Utah, and all just flat, endless rocks and dry grass, uh, an occasional antelope, and uh, it, was, it was brutal. But, you know, my mom, she was there to, to help us kids make it through the trip, and she'd play these road games with us. We played the alphabet game. I don't know how many, how many times, you know, you try to find the next, the first to be the next letter in the alphabet, and the first person to get to Z wins the game, and, and then we also looked for different state license plates on the cars that we passed by. And of course, there's the classic, I spy with my little eye. I don't know how many times we played that game. I was glad to see Colorado. I didn't know what to expect, but it was nice to see a change in the scenery, to start seeing some trees and, and some hills. However, my grandpa, he lived on a ranch up in the mountains, and, and the road up there had a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns. And, of course, I was sitting in the middle, and I couldn't see what was coming, so I got terribly car sick. Wound up puking all over the back seat of that little Honda station wagon. My brother and sister were not too happy about that. But in this picture, you see, I'm, I'm the one holding his belly in the front there because I did not enjoy that trip. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but I wasn't expecting that. And that's kind of how it was with Abram. When he answered God's call to leave his country, the community that he was a part of, and his father's household, and go to a land that God would show him. He didn't know what to expect, and there were a lot of ups and downs, a lot of twists and turns. But he discovered that God was with him all along the way. 
And, and even when he messed up, even in those, those bad times, God was helping him to grow in his faith and to learn to depend on God. It wasn't just about the destination. It was also about the journey. As we continue to look at the life of Abram this morning, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. We're going to read about this next uh, portion of the journey in Abraham's life. And before we read this passage, let's go to God in a word of prayer and let's ask God to speak to us through his word this morning. God, we are so thankful that we have this time to, to honor you, to worship you, and to hear from you. God, we recognize that the Bible is your word, your inspired, authoritative, practical, relevant word for our lives today. So God, I pray as we read about the life of Abram this morning, that you would speak to our hearts, open our eyes, and help us to see things in your word that apply to the different areas of life, the different uh, parts of the journey where we are on in our walk with you, in our journey through this life. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be transformed, uh, help us to make adjustments uh, according to your word as we read what you have to say to us this morning. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 13, 1 through 18. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw the whole plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south. East and west, all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is God's word. Uh, And it's God's word to us today. He is giving us a, a view of what took place in this journey of faith in Abram's life. And he's giving us some important principles for the journey of faith that each of us are walking on in our lives. And I see here four important principles, relevant and practical, for our lives today. 
How should we respond to Genesis 13? Well, first of all, we need to prioritize the Lord above everything else. You know, in our busy, fast-paced world, it's easy to get distracted, isn't it, with all these different things going on, especially this year in 2020. It's easy to get distracted and lose sight of what's really important. And of course, our culture of materialism it gives us this tendency to measure our success by the world's standards, by uh, the standard of living that we enjoy, or by the amount of our possessions, or, or the size of our house, or the size of our paychecks. But none of those things should be our main priority in life. Having wealth is not wrong. Abram was a very wealthy man. But we need to make sure that God remains our first priority, regardless of our standard of living, regardless of how much wealth he has blessed us with. And that's what we see exemplified by Abram. When he left Egypt, Abram was a very rich man. Back in Genesis 12, 16, we saw that the Lord had blessed him with all these gifts, all these possessions while he was in Egypt. He, he gained more sheep, more cattle, more donkeys, more camels, and with that, more servants. And here in chapter 13, we see that he is also rich in silver and gold. Abram takes all this stuff, all these possessions that he acquired in Egypt along with him as he comes back into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And all this stuff, especially the servants that he has acquired, it's all going to cause some complications in his life. It's going to make his life actually more difficult rather than easier. However, at this point, Abraham is still focused on the Lord. He recognizes the mistakes that he made in Egypt. He knows that he never should have told his wife to lie about her identity, that she was just his sister. And he knows that, that he, he blew it. I mean, he ruined his testimony before the Pharaoh by his dishonesty. He knows that he should have trusted the Lord instead of giving in to fear and doubt. So he returns to the promised land with a heart focused on God. He wants to leave those mistakes in the past, and he wants to come back to God. And he goes from place to place until he comes to that altar he built near Bethel. And this is what the text says in, in verse 4 of chapter 13, where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. This was the last place mentioned in chapter 12 where Abram builds an altar and calls on the name of the Lord. And we see that uh, he's not just coming back to a geographical place. He's coming back to a spiritual place in his life. He's remembering that first commitment he made when God called him, that first step of faith that he took when he set out to go to this land that God was leading him to, and that decision to leave a culture of idolatry and worship Yahweh as the one true God. On uh, this map, uh, we see three different places where Abram built altars to the Lord. We've already read about two of them in chapter 12. First, he came to Shechem, and the Lord appeared to him at Shechem. And that's, where, that's the first place where we see Abram building an altar to the Lord, to Yahweh. And then he comes down to an area between Bethel and Ai, and he camps there for a while, and he builds an altar there. And that's where he is now at the beginning of chapter 13, and that's where he built another altar to the Lord, and he calls on the name of the Lord. Later at the end of this chapter, we'll see him building another altar even further south at uh, the town of Hebron. And we'll get to that when we get to the end of the chapter. But these altars that he's building, these are significant stations, uh, monuments. They are permanent testimonies of Abram's faith in Yahweh as the one true God and God's promise to Abram. They are statements that remind Abram of his commitment, 
but they're also statements that serve as a testimony, a witness to all the people who ever pass by. Oh yeah, this is one of those altars that that guy Abram builds. He, he only believes in one God. And he's, he's given up a life of idolatry, of worshiping all these other gods. He is completely devoted to just this one God. That, that was a testimony to all the people who ever passed by those altars. And Abram made that decision. I mean, his father, Terah, worshiped idols. Abram made the decision to leave that culture of idolatry and just worship Yahweh as the one true God. No idol, no false god, no person, and no thing in his life would ever take first place, a higher priority above Yahweh, the one true God. Even though his life was complicated, and it was getting more complicated, he was determined to make the Lord first in his life. And that's how it should be with us as well. In Colossians 1.18, Paul describes Jesus this way. He is also head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Is he truly the, the number one priority in your life. Think about all the things that make up your life, what your calendar looks like, what your checkbook looks like, and all the different relationships that you're involved in, and all the different uh, responsibilities you have, all these things that, that make our lives so busy and complicated. In all those areas of life, does Jesus have the first place? How should we respond to Genesis chapter 13? Well, we also need to promote peace with one another. Life is too short to waste countless hours arguing and fighting with one another over things like politics. And and families, our relationships are too precious to risk dividing them, splitting them up because of disagreements about financial matters. I'm not saying that these things are not important, and I'm not saying that we should avoid any and all controversial topics. But when it comes to our relationships, especially in our families and especially in the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, when we have disagreements, we need to promote peace. We need to look for peaceful solutions that help us to maintain unity. Yes, we can have differences of opinion, but as brothers and sisters... Are we promoting peace and maintaining unity? That was the situation that Abram and Lot were facing in Genesis 13. They had both become very wealthy. They had a lot of livestock, and because of all these extra sheep and cattle and donkeys and camels they had, they needed more servants to take care of them. And really, it was the servants that made their lives a lot more complicated, and it will continue to cause complications in the lives of Abram and Lot. One of the servants that Abram probably picked up in Egypt was Hagar. We'll find out about the complications in that situation later on in the book of Genesis. But here they are, back in the promised land, there between Bethel and Ai, and the place where they're camping is not large enough to sustain all the livestock they have. There's not enough grazing land for all of their possessions. And the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram are not getting along together. They're fighting with each other. They're like those kids in the backseat of the car on that long road trip, arguing and bickering and fighting. He's on my side. He's touching me. This is my area. You need to take your animals over there. The sad thing about this dispute was the fact that this was largely caused by this increase of all these possessions they, they acquired in Egypt. All these extra sheep, cattle, donkeys, and camels required more servants to take care of them and to find pasture land for them. And suddenly their lives were becoming a lot more complicated because of all these people they had to manage as well as all the livestock they had to take care of. 
And of course, the herdsmen were not concerned about peace in the family. The herdsmen were concerned about the jobs they were given to take care of livestock. So the herdsmen of Lot were concerned about what was best for Lot's animals. And the herdsmen of Abraham, uh, they were concerned primarily about how to best care for Abram's animals. They weren't concerned about peace in the family. They were concerned about taking care of animals. So while one group of herdsmen was focused on doing what was best for Lot's animals, the other group of herdsmen were focused on doing what was best for Abram's animals, and neither one of them, none of them, were really concerned about peace in the family. But look at how Abram responds to this situation in verse 8. Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Notice how he takes the focus off of the animals and brings it back to the family. He takes it off of the possessions and brings it back to peace. You see, Abram was more concerned about peace than he was about possessions. He was more concerned about unity in the family than he was about land. And he even puts land, his inheritance, at risk in order to bring about peace in the family. In the very next verse, he offers Lot first choice of all the land before him. And he promises, whatever direction you go, I'll go the other direction. He had his priorities straight. He had his values based on God's values. Peace in the family of God is more important than possessions. And that's the attitude we should have as Christians. Jesus has called us to be peacemakers. And that doesn't mean that we never take a stand on anything. That doesn't mean that we'll never have to to fight to defend ourselves or, or the lives of our family members. We'll find this out in the next chapter. Next week, we'll see that Abram is not a pacifist. He's a peacemaker, but he's not a pacifist. What this means is that we need to look first for peaceful options. We we need to look for ways, solutions to difficulties and differences that will bring about peace and unity. Uh, Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, some people are really stubborn. Have you noticed that? So, yeah, I mean, there's going to be differences and disagreements and arguments where no matter what kind of peaceful solution we suggest, there's going to be times when we cannot achieve peace and unity. But as far as it depends on us, that's the direction we need to go. That's what we need to promote. And this is especially true when it comes to our relationships with one another in the church, in God's family as brothers and sisters. In this dispute between Abram and Lot, it says right there in the context that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land. And and certainly that's a statement about how the land was limited and how much livestock it could support. But I think it's there for a more important reason, a spiritual reason. See, Abram knew that he blew it in Egypt. He ruined his testimony before the Pharaoh. His character was not what it should have been. He had the opportunity in Egypt to be a testimony of a Yahweh follower, a believer in the one true God by being a man of character, honesty, and integrity, a man trusting God, and he blew it. He he showed the Pharaoh a life of dishonesty. He doesn't want to make that mistake again. He wants to be a good testimony to the people around him, these Canaanites and Perizzites. What are they going to think when they see Abram, this guy who worships one God, and builds all these altars all over the land to this one God, what are they going to think when they see the followers of this God fighting and arguing with each other? More importantly, what about us? What do unbelievers in the world today think when they see Christians fighting and arguing with each other on social media? 
or churches being split apart over silly reasons, or Christians refusing to talk to each other because they're holding grudges against each other. What kind of a testimony is that? You know, Jesus, in John 17, right before he would go to the garden, right before he would be arrested, before his crucifixion, he prayed for us. He prayed for our unity so that the world might believe in Jesus Christ. As much as it depends on us, we need to promote peace and unity in God's family. What is our response to Genesis chapter 13? Well, we, certainly we need to uh, promote unity and peace, but we also need to pursue righteousness and flee from evil. And many times our choices between what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, are clouded and camouflaged. This is one of Satan's tricks. He, he doesn't want to make any of our choices e- easy to make. And so he'll disguise our choices as much as possible and get us distracted by the things of this world. And that's kind of what's taking place here when Lot has a decision to make. Abram gave Lot the first choice of the land in any direction, and Lot looked over east of the Jordan River, and he saw the the Jordan Valley lush and green like the garden of the Lord, like, like the land of Egypt where the Nile comes in and brings all this Uh, all these nutrients to the topsoil and and makes it lush and and fertile. He was looking for what would be best for his material possessions. He wasn't so much concerned about the spiritual culture of the people around him as much as he was what would be best for his material profits. The grass looked greener on the other side of the fence, or in this case, on the other side of the river. So that's where Lot went. He went where the grass looked greener. Verse 12 says, Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. After Lot went east, he went south toward the city of Sodom. And he didn't go there because he knew that their lifestyle was evil. He was not attracted to the sinful culture of that city. He went there because of the financial prospects. It was a promising place to do business. He could take his wool there, his livestock there. He could take it to the market of those cities in in, uh, the south around the Dead Sea. And he could make a, a great profit. I'm sure he had good intentions. He probably thought that the financial prosperity and the higher standard standard of living would be good for his family. But the very next verse says that the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And think about that phrase. I mean, the, the author of the text goes out of his way to show just how depraved this culture was. And the, the, by the way, the word here for men... It's not the general word Adam for human, mankind. It's the specific word for male, ish. The males of Sodom were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. Later in chapter 19, we'll find out what exactly that means. Compared to the men of Sodom, Lot was a righteous man. But like many Christians today... He was being influenced by the values of the culture, the materialistic values of the culture. He was like like Christian parents today who are not concerned about who their Christian children date, whether they're Christians or not. They're more concerned about uh, the financial well-being of the boyfriends and girlfriends of their children than they are about the spiritual well-being of their children. Boyfriends, the boyfriends and girlfriends of their children. He was like those, those Christian parents who are preparing to send their children off to college, and they're more concerned about the financial prospects of this career path than of the spiritual well-being of their children when they go off to college. 
And, and, and they, uh, they focus on the question of what kind of financial prosperity will this career path at this school provide for my child than anything else? They're not even concerned about the spiritual well-being of their child when they go off to college. Two-thirds Two-thirds of all Christians who grow up attending church as children will leave the church in their college years. Parents who are looking for colleges for their children need to think about the spiritual well-being of their children. They need to start asking questions like, uh, what is the moral and spiritual environment at this college? Uh, what kind of struggles and difficulties will, will this culture bring into the life of our children? What do the professors believe and teach about God, the Bible, and Christianity at that school? Is there an active Christian group of, of students who meet together and encourage each other and build each other up in their faith? I strongly recommend that all Christians, once they get out of high school, spend at least one year going to Bible college to further ground their faith in God's Word and develop a deeper understanding of God's Word so they'll be able to defend their faith and know why they believe what they believe. Later in chapter 19, we'll see how Lot's decision affected his family. At this point, we see that Lot is still living in tents, near Sodom. But when we get to chapter 19, he's no longer living in a tent. He's living in a house in the city of Sodom. And he even has a chair at the gate. He's intricately involved in the culture of the city. Once we start moving toward a sinful culture, it starts to draw us in and becomes more and more difficult to back off and, and get away from it. We need to pursue righteousness and flee evil. Look at the warning that Paul gives Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, certainly God does not want us to be completely cut off from the world. He doesn't want us to be monks living in a monastery. He wants us to have an effect on the culture around us. But at the same time, we need to make sure that our closest friends, our mentors in life, are Christians, people who will encourage us to pursue righteousness and flee from evil. Think about who you spend your time with. Think about those people who are the most influential friends and mentors in your life. Are they believers? Are they Christians? Are they people who help you flee from evil and pursue righteousness? And we need to make sure that we have a time, a regular time every week, where we fellowship with people who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. How should we respond to Genesis chapter 13? We need to praise God for his promises. I imagine that Abram was not happy about this situation. I imagine that he was really concerned about the choice that Lot made. While they were separating peacefully, they were still separating. He would no longer have the same influence on his nephew that he used to have. And I'm sure he knew that Lot was not strong enough in his faith to resist the influence of the culture he was going into. But right after Lot left, God spoke to Abram, and he reminded Abram of those precious promises that he had given him in the previous chapter. First, God tells Abram that he needs to look around, look in every direction, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look at the west. See all this land around you as far as you can see. And God promises to him, this is yours. I'm going to give all this land to you and your offspring forever. And then God reminds him that, yes, he really is going to be a great nation. And it's going to be through your offspring. Literally, the word is their seed. It's going to be through your seed. 
It's not going to be through an adopted son like your nephew Lot. It's going to be through your child. And your offspring is going to be more numerous than the dust over the entire world, if that could be counted. I love what God says next, though. This is amazing. God commands Abram to walk through all the land, really get a firsthand experience of what this promise includes. And that word there, walk, halak in Hebrew, is in a unique verb form that is both reflexive and intensive. It's called the Hithpael verb stem or verb form, and it's unique. It's rarely used. The reflexive idea means that it the subject, in this case, Abram, is both doing the action and receiving the action. It's like God is commanding Abram, go walk yourself through the land. Go do this action in a way that it's going to do something to you, okay? And then it's also intensive, and that, that's emphasizing both the purpose of the action and the process of the action. And this, this form the Hithpael, with this particular verb, halak, is so rare, it's usually only used in reference to God walking. It was used when, when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It was used to refer to Noah walking with God and Enoch walking with God. So this is a clue that this is not just a survey of land. This is part of Abram's relationship with God. Part of him walking with God in such a way that it changes him. And it's a picture of our relationship with God. God is commanding us to walk with him on this journey in a way that it changes us. In a way that we see all these promises that God has given to us. And we allow it to change us. As Abram continues to think about and experience these promises of God, he can't help but worship God. Look at what happens in the last verse of this chapter. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre in Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord, to Yahweh, the one true God. Wherever he went, he continued to worship Yahweh. Not because he had to, but he loved to, and he wanted to. And it was, it was part of his growing journey of faith. We saw him build two altars in chapter 12, one at Shechem and one near Bethel. Now he builds another one in the south at Hebron. And all these altars will stand as permanent reminders, testimonies of God's promises to Abram and Abram's faith in those promises. On his journey of faith, Abram had many ups and downs, many twists and turns, and a lot of times he could not see them coming. But he knew that God was with him. And he had those promises. As he held on to those promises, as he remembered and meditated on those promises, he had the strength to continue on in his journey. And the same is true for us. God has given us precious promises to help us continue on in the journey of faith that we're on. No matter where we are in our journey, whether we're going up into a mountaintop experience where our faith soars or where we're finding ourselves in a valley struggling with fear and doubt, God is with us. And these promises encourage us and help us to carry on. This is what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. He's talking about that walking with God, the Holy Spirit living within us, changing us, helping us to participate in this divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. When we take the Lord's Supper, whenever we meditate on the gospel, 
when we remember the promises that we have because of what Jesus has done for us, we, like Abraham, should feel compelled to worship and praise God for his promises and be strengthened to continue on in our journey of faith. As we continue in our journey of faith, as we go up these mountains and down into these valleys, and as we face good times and bad times, remember the promises of God. Remember, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. Remember, in Hebrews 13, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yes, God has given us awesome promises about the destination, heaven, eternal life, uh, a glorious eternity with God forever, uh, a new resurrected body free from pain, free from disease and death and sin. Yes, those promises of the destination are awesome, and we always need to keep those in mind. But also, let's remember the promises for right now, the promises he's given us for the journey we're on right now. He is with us always, even to the very end of the age. We're going to pray and sing one more song. And as we do that, let's think about how we can respond to God's word this week. Let's prioritize the Lord above everything else. Let's promote peace among one another, especially among our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pursue righteousness and flee immorality and evil desires. And let's praise God for his promises. Let's stand and we'll have a prayer before we sing this final song. God, we are so thankful for what Christ has done for us and, and how you have given us these precious and great promises God, we know that on this journey of faith, uh, we can't always see what's coming. And there's going to be ups and downs and twists and turns. But God, we know that you are with us through it all. And God, especially this year in 2020, I pray that you'd help us to remember those promises. Uh, as, as many of us are going through difficult times, many of us are in valleys right now. God, help us to be strengthened by your promises as we continue on in this journey of faith. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.